Our guest today is best known as a Christian singer and songwriter. He's recorded over 31 albums of music with 4 million albums sold in total. He's written over 19 number one hits, co-authored or authored 24 books, and hosted a radio program. He is a graduate of Western Kentucky University, has an honorary doctorate from Cairn, and when not touring, lives in Franklin, Tennessee with his wife, Susan. So we're very pleased to welcome, as our guest today, a new grandfather, Thank Michael you. Carr. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's Mr. <laughs> grandfather to you. That's right. Doctor, actually. <laughs> doctor, yeah, doctor grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm just curious if you could set some context here. When uh, did you first start playing music, and then when did that transition into something that you thought might be a vocational or a ministry path for you? Okay. Well, I, I grew up in Nashville, so I've been playing, I've been playing the guitar as long as, literally as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. Um, all my friends growing up in high school and junior high, we all, we played bluegrass, we played, you know, 50s music. We were always, always making music. So that, that was something that was always there. Plus, everyone in my family is a musician. My mother and father were both musicians, and my brother and sister are, are musicians. And they're, actually, they're all better musicians than I am. And, um, but then I, I went to school. Uh, Initially, I was pursuing another degree, but I ended up doing biblical studies, which is what I've been sort of investing myself in ever since. And one of my uh, professors, who was also the pastor of the church I attended, one Sunday he said, uh, you, you play guitar, don't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, here's my sermon for next week. Write us a chorus. Hmm. And I would love to say, Jonathan, that I'm this spiritual, faithful man who heard God's voice, and, but I really was just trying to please Dr. Lane, the, my, the pastor. And for, uh, for about six years, we did this. He would give me his sermons, and I would write little choruses, and uh, never really thinking it would go anywhere. And uh, then it turned into you know, what I ended up doing for the last 35 years. So it sounds like these two things always kind of worked together for you, or at least for a long time it worked mm -hmm. together for you. There wasn't some point of conflict where you said either I want to study the Bible or do music or something like that. Not, not really. I mean, there was a momentary... It may have, may have been a momentary sort of rub, but uh, even when I started making records, um, I was helping someone else out. The record really wasn't about me. It was about a production company that was starting, and uh, they needed a guinea pig. And uh, it was, In fact, it, it was one of the guys I grew up in high school playing uh, music with, and uh, they needed someone to produce, and, and he asked me, and I said, sure, I'll help out. And um, But when they were shopping this recording around to get themselves jobs as producers, one company said, well, we'll hire you as producers if you'll produce this guy. Hmm. So e even then it was kind of gradual and I thought, well, I'll do this for a year and then I'll go back to school, which is what I'm supposed to do, right? So uh, then there were, that was the 35 year detour. <laughs> <laughs> so after you, um, after you were doing these, uh, setting these sermons to music, making mm -hmm. courses from these sermons, uh, and, and then you moved into sort of doing this uh, apart from that local church, right. What, what were you seeking to do in your songs, or what maybe are you seeking to do? Has that, has that changed? No, or? it really hadn't. Uh, and the, the wonderful way, and, and the Lord has been so good to me in this, I had this marvelous content for six years. People say, oh, your songs are so biblical. Yeah, I was writing for a PhD from Harvard who mm -hmm. gave me every Sunday this unbelievable material that was also very lyrical. And, uh, and, and the other part of the picture was in this little church, it was a little African-American church, about 25 members. And in the context of that community, I was always given affirmation, even when I did poorly, which you need, right? In fact, you need, you, someone said, you need love the most when you deserve it the least, hmm. right? And that's, that was my experience. Uh, and so really, unbeknownst to me, the Lord was training me to be a songwriter with this great context and with incredible content. And then when that transition took place, the big, the big difference was I was generating the content on my own. Mm -hmm. I didn't have his sermons anymore. But um, I had six years worth of songs to start with, which is mm -hmm. pretty cool. And then you tried to sort of replicate what you were doing then, but you were the one doing the studying. You were the one thinking it through biblically. Yeah, I, I didn't know any other way to do it mm -hmm. besides take a passage and you know, look at it and engage with it, you know, try to make it believable and bring it out. And uh, yeah, so really I, I had this great, great preacher, great Bible teacher as a, as a mentor and I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, 
if I had thought I was going to do this the rest of my life, uh, spend the rest of my life doing this, I probably would have messed it up somehow. But since I didn't know, really know what I was doing, I, I, I didn't mess it up. I just soaked, I soaked in uh, this uh, content and this re remarkable man, William Lane. He was a commentary writer who passed away in 99. Great, great man. But now, looking back, would you give, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's just, who's very interested in music, serious about their faith? I mean, would you mm -hmm. say, engage with the local church? I mean, yeah. what, uh, what would you say to them? I wouldn't, yeah, that, one of the few things I can point to myself as an exemplar, because I didn't know what I was doing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I tell kids, and that's why I love this uh, Karen so much, you know, it, engage with Scripture, you know, just soak yourself in, in Scripture. Because in my opinion, and this may sound opinionated, but there's really nothing else worth singing about, in my opinion. Uh, so you engage in Scripture and you, get, you engage in the community. And what you discover is that in the context of community, that's where creativity really happens. Creativity isn't this, the, the soul artist struggling with the muse kind of image that we bought into. It, it's always been, even from, from the Renaissance, it's, it's been a community, a, a, a matter of community. And how much better when it's Christian community and there, there are needs that I can try to address in the songs that I write or the sermons are, if you're a pastor, the sermons you write. Uh, you're writing for someone's need, which um, is completely different than trying to write a song that's going to be played on the radio that people are going to buy. Yeah, it sounds like the perception someone might have, though, is that writing for someone's need constrains you. No, it opens you up. No, I mean, when... When a, when a songwriter has nothing bigger to point to than himself, I can't think of a more confining place. Mm -hmm. But when, when you interact with other people's needs and other people's hurts and other people's joys, although I haven't done that as much as needs, um, I mean, the palate just gets, you know, and then they add scripture into that whole equation. And it's, you know, you'll never end. There's no end mm -hmm. to the songs that you, mm -hmm. you, you can write. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm here in a place like uh, Karen, I, uh, that's my constant message to mm -hmm. kids because it's amazing how many kids are writing songs now. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the idea of community not being confining but being actually this space for oh, yeah. creativity. Absolutely, yeah. and, and encouragement yeah. and... and um, and, uh, well, accountability, but also um, I, I think there's such a thing as a aesthetic accountability. So, you know, people can have the freedom within the context of that relationship and community to say, that song's not really very good. Right. And, and this is why. Right. And that's coming from a friend who loves you more when you write a bad song. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just doesn't get any better than that, as opposed to a stranger who's writing in some magazine. I mean, the, the bad reviews that I've had in the past, and I've had a lot of them, um, they're just, they're hard to get over sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're mean-spirited. Of course, they all sound mean-spirited to me. But um, the, the, the difference between community input and um, industry, just call it industry input, is, it's all the difference in the world. Because you got, in a sense, bad reviews from your community, but it didn't stick with you as a painful it, thing? It made me better. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Um, in, in the context of this little church I was in, uh, we had women deacons and um, Thelma Baker was our chief deacon, deaconess, and uh, she was sort of my main critic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd, I'd get this big hug, and then she'd say, you wrote that on the way to church, didn't you? I can tell. And she was <laughs> usually right. She, mm -hmm. you know, she could tell. Uh, but if, if, you did, uh, if, if a song really worked, and she said, you know, you really did it that time, mm -hmm. oh, man, it's like the sun rose, and, you know, uh, that affirmation meant everything. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's 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 that makes all the difference in the world. Criticism within community. That's a, yeah. That's helpful. Constructive. Yeah. It's yeah. Constructive at that point. Yeah. yeah. Now uh, I want to talk about some of the biblical themes you've explored okay. uh, as you look back and and see the study and 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 then and then the study which has led to the songs. Are, you mentioned just a minute ago that you see uh, a, one of the threads that's running through it is you've talked more maybe about grief and difficulty mm -hmm. than about joyful things. Is, yeah. that, is that something you see in, in retrospect? It, it really is. I, I've had it pointed out to me um, in, just recently, too. Uh, in, in, uh, I had an elderly woman say, you know, you, you write a lot about suffering, but you don't write about the power of the resurrection. You know, mm -hmm. you, she was being, in a very kindly way, she was saying, you know, maybe you should mm -hmm. <laughs> focus more because, I mean, for years, one of my first big theme was the scandal of the gospel. Mm -hmm. I did that 
I did that theme for two or three years, and my wife basically said, could you please sing about something else? But I was just so, I was captivated by the theme, and I thought it was something that people really needed to hear mm -hmm. at that point. And then I went straight from that to, you know, crucifixion and from that to laments mm -hmm. and, you know, and uh, I don't know, maybe there's something easier about writing, writing, uh, you know, uh, in terms of those kinds of feelings than, I've, I've not, I've frankly not experienced a lot of the power of the resurrection. I take that by faith. And uh, I, have, I have two or three songs about the resurrection that I hope there's some personal uh, involvement in. Uh, but I, I'm a person... Well, what does Paul say? You know, I, um, I want to know uh, the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Those mm -hmm. two go together. But it strikes me that most of the Christian music, at least that's being sung in congregations today, does not strike those notes. Um, yeah. it, it's not lament. Right, which is another reason why I did that, trying to fill that, fill that space. Mm -hmm. So what's the value of it? Uh, well, for me, it's it's including a group of people who are, are being excluded uh, in this works, in this sort of uh, in this current worship uh, movement, which is a good thing. Um, when it's all positive, uh, those people who are struggling. Uh, I had a sister who lost two infants in in 13 months in two separate uh, occasions, and uh, there was no one who who was mindful of her. Suffering. I mean, we have people with cancer. We have, I mean, all, mm -hmm. just name, you can pile up this mountain of, of suffering that's out there because it's a fallen world. And um, there's no place in the current worship movement for those people to offer up their confusion and their, and their grief. But when you turn the Bible, I mm -hmm. mean, numerically, most of the Psalms are laments. Most of the Psalms are saying, you know, when I needed you the most, that's when you were the farthest from helping me. Mm -hmm. And yet you sing something like that now in an American church and people think, you've lost your faith or right. whatever. And uh, it's that, and frankly, I just find it more interesting. It's this idea of that struggling with God, uh, wrestling with God, uh, that, that uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel is sort of a great metaphor for. Uh, I just find that more interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe at some point I'll, I'll have this victorious life, experience of the victorious life. But I don't know for now that I'm just surrounded by so many people that are hurting. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to be connected to that in any way I can. Yeah, and it seems like, ironically, the emphasis on just rejoicing uh, can further sort of pile on if, uh, to people's feelings of suffering because they feel like, I, I have nothing to sing Absolutely. In, in, in what I'm going through. Absolutely. And eventually, I think, you, you, you know, when you're, when you're not given a place in the community, eventually, I think you conclude that, well, then there, God really doesn't have a place mm -hmm. for me, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I know so many people who who felt uh, like second class spiritual citizens because they, but but in, in in truth, in terms of biblical truth, they are the people that God is saying, you know, worship is you know this communication, this connection with God, you know, show me your your contrite spirit and your broken heart, mm -hmm. right? Those are the sacrifices that, that that He really wants, and I just think that's it's an elegant idea. Um, and I point to the fact that when Jesus was most being used by God, he was lamenting, mm -hmm. right? Why have mm -hmm. you forsaken me? And um, I don't know if, 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 if I'm struggling or hurting or, or even angry, you know, struggling with those kind of feelings, I think that's really good news, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to move from lament to the Gospels. I know mm -hmm. you're doing a lot of work right now thinking yeah. through the Gospels. Uh, how did that start? What, 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 what's going on in your mind right now and in your sort of creative work? Well, that's interesting because I, I haven't thought how it started, but um, really the way it started was more, more of this negativity, a redemptive negativity. Uh, I wrote a book on slavery in the New Testament, um, which was a very uh, unpopular book. Um, but I, I, was, I, was, I was discipled in an African-American church where in that church we referred to Jesus as master. Mm -hmm. And um, when I asked our pastor, where does that come from? He says, well, that comes from slavery. The slaves called Jesus master to let their earthly masters know they weren't master. Mm -hmm. Jesus was their master. Mm -hmm. And I found that really interesting. And so I, I did what I do and I kind of run it, ran the idea in scripture. And of course, it's on every page, everyone's identity you know, from the prophets, my, my slaves, the prophets, uh, Abraham was the slave of Yahweh, and then Jesus, Mary, Peter, Jude, 
James, they, Paul, they all identify themselves as slaves to Christ. Well, I want to stop you there for just a second. I do want to hear about the Gospels, mm -hmm. but then what you're saying is it didn't have negative connotations for this African-American community. No. It was actually sort of subversive Absolutely. of all the negative slavery well, connotations. Well, it, it, it gave meaning to their, to their struggles, to their sorrows. I mean, you know, Afri African-American laments and uh, Negro spirituals, mm -hmm. you know, that was sort of what's, I think, kept the, that church so strong for so many years. And, and, and so that's where I started. I got interested in slavery. Yeah. And as I was researching this, I, I uh, became convinced that Luke was a slave. Uh, because Luke is, a, I was studying slave names. <laughs> Got really bored. I read this really boring academic stuff and try to make hay out of it. But I, I discovered that Luke is a slave name, and then somewhere else I saw that most doctors in the first century were slaves. I knew Luke was a, for sure that he was a doctor because Paul said he was. So I thought, man, Luke, you know, is Luke a slave? Well, let me look at his book and see if it reflects that. And all of a sudden, the Gospel of Luke just opened up. Hmm. It explains his concern for marginalized people. Uh, 16 of the 35 parables are slave parables, and the slaves are always the good guys. I mean, it's just, it really became this huge piece to Luke. And, uh, and so I, I did a, a little devotional commentary on Luke, and I was sort of off, off to the races. Mm -hmm. And then the publisher said, why don't let's do uh, Mark? Mm -hmm. so, so I'm in. So I've done all, all of them. Um, I just handed in John about a month ago, so mm -hmm. I'm done with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then has that worked its way not just into books, but also into songs that you're writing and things yeah. like that? Yeah, I've done an album. I've done a book and an album and a teaching video uh, from Israel on each one. So you go to all the Luke sites and you know stand there and sort of pretend like you know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's been interesting because I've, I've I've covered with a very broad brush the Gospels. I mean, earlier years ago. But it's been great to go back and uh, and and look a little more detail. Uh, I'm actually writing the John songs right now, um, and, and and this I just love doing this kind of thing. It's uh, I find, I mean I know the, all those theological things we say about Jesus. I mean I'll take a bullet for his divinity and the, his part in the Trinity and authority of Scripture. All those things I'll take a bullet for all those things. But on top of that, I just find him endlessly fascinating. I just find that he is. He is such an interesting person and compelling, and uh, the, the closer I get to, to each one of the gospel writers, and I see this nuanced picture of Jesus that each one of them has. You know, Luke mm -hmm. is interested in things that Mark is not the least interested in, mm -hmm. and so, so I've got this, you know, one picture of Jesus, sort of the man of action, and Mark, who, who doesn't speak very much at all, and then Matthew gives me this lengthy blocks of teaching of Jesus, so I get Jesus the teacher there. And people have done this, I mean, since the time of Eusebius. They were trying to see the differences in the Gospels. But uh, I've really, I'm telling you, I've, I've never been more excited uh, uh, about the Bible as, as, mm. as now. And, look, and, and the next step for me is, and this is what I think I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing, is I'm interested in, in making those four uh, nuanced uh, images. I'm, in, I'm interested in what happens when they converge. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when I have this, you know, very well integrated uh, in New Testament image and Old Testament image of Jesus and, and have it match the, the person in my head that I pray to and speak to, mm -hmm. I think that's a neat idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. well, one of the notes that you struck there is, is one that I've heard many times before, which is people saying, the more I study the Bible the more I realize I'm just scratching the surface oh, yeah. Yeah. and it's just, it's this endless, it's this endless joy. And that's, I've, I've heard the same thing. My, my mentor who actually had the Bible memorized, wow. he had a photographic memory. He taught mm -hmm. from memory, um, you know, which the rabbis used to do in Jesus' mm -hmm. day. They had the whole thing memorized. And he said the same thing at the end of his life. And he was, you know, he'd written commentaries and had taught it for years and years and years. And he said, yeah, I've just, what you said, he said, I've just barely scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, sh nothing else like Shakespeare is not like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no other book like that. And uh, just one, one other reason that I'm so excited about the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time and thank, thank you. you for all, the, all your labors and all your work. And we're, we're pleased to call you a friend. Thank you.